Welcome back. Um, we're just going to do what we do best and just watch the games today. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what's going on. Um, but one thing's for sure is that I'm not the person playing um, uh, in the spot of our beloved champion. Just verify everything looks okay. Yeah, it looks fine. Nice. <laughs> oh, Chatty says my stream is offline. That would not be accurate. Okay, so um, you've got a Grandmaster playing against a Fide Master, more commonly referred to as a Master. Uh, he seems to be hanging in there. Like, I'm not sure um, what... Certainly Black has initiative because White's King is a little bit exposed and... Um, Black's giving up material to pursue an attack, but it, something about this doesn't look right. It, like normally, when the world champion goes on an attack, um, it tends to be pretty decisive. And here, um, White is putting up quite a fight. White is in a little bit of time pressure, but he's also got a winning endgame if everything gets traded. So I think what happened here is White just had the advantage of going first and played some solid moves and our world champions taking some risks um, and seems to maybe be getting rewarded for it I don't know it's not so clear what's going on gotta defend the bishop uh, but there's no way to defend it so we have a perpetual check now oh there it is all right oh dear well, our champion wins again. <laughs> um, that was exciting. Holy moly. So you have a 2800 rated uh, master playing on the site. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, sure, I'll allow it. Yeah, that's what struck me. Is I'm like, somebody's got to commentate this. And I know... Uh, some of the Lee Chess folk are otherwise occupied in meetings and such, so hey, I'd be glad to give it a shot. Oh, uh, now I understand what promotion means. Okay, well, that'll be interesting. Um, yeah, so I saw that at least at present, uh, our world champion's busy playing. He doesn't want to commentate while he's playing. It, it, Tech-wise, that doesn't always work out. Um, and further, I find even when I'm playing, it's a bit distracting for me to try to commentate while I'm doing it. So um, what surprised me is that nobody else was doing it. I'm like, okay, somebody's got to. Yeah, so that's... Well, curiously, their uh, international master... I guess he doesn't play as much bullet there, but with a 2700 rating. Um, but he was keeping up on the clock. And so I just found it amazing. If you'd saw, seen our previous game, uh, we had a master playing against um, and managing to mostly keep up on the clock and unfortunately timed out. Um, well, isn't that an interesting opening? It's like a hippopotamus with... Oh, oh right. Yeah, there's the mate in one threat. So you had to deal with that. Um, that's pretty typical in this opening. All right, um, White's up material and is going to go on to win this. It's just a question of when, um, provided that like he doesn't lose his king in the center of the board. Okay, yeah. Wow. And that's why uh, Magnus here has a 2900 rating on the site. Um, 
just plays interesting moves throughout the entire game and doesn't hang material too often even while he's playing very quickly Alright, we got our two titans. We got Andrew Tang, uh, Grandmaster. Um, fastest mouse on the site. Uh, versus the world champion. Got a pin. I don't know if I like the knight on a6. Um, it's going to find its way into the game eventually. And I guess white's pawns aren't really producing any pawn break ideas, so black can afford to take a few moves to shuffle pieces around. Um, at some point, white might try to gain some more space if he has uh, tempo to do it. Um, Oh, are we going to get an endgame? Both players still have about uh, at least 25 seconds apiece, so we might actually see a legitimate endgame. Unless the world champion just drops a piece, which I didn't really expect to happen. Um, well, this should also be exciting, eh? Okay, that's going to hurt. Yeah. Yeah. It's one thing if you're down an exchange or down a minor piece. It's another thing if you're also losing all of your pawns. So, um, all right, we've got Ali Reza playing. Wow, what a strong field. Um, I don't know this variation. Oh, also, let me turn my speaker down a bit. That should help. Okay, we got a pawn break in the center. And now we've got a rook end game, and we know all rook end games are drawn, uh, except when you're playing bullet chess, when really anything could happen. Um, uh, I guess Black offered a queen trade because his king's in some danger, and he believes more in his opponent's attack than he believes in his own in this particular position. Um, So the knight on d5 is excellently positioned, um, keeps all the opponent's pieces away from the center of the board. Surely we're going to see white take en passant, uh, or not. I mean, this is exciting, but um, unless I've miscalculated something, like, okay, there's a lot I'm not seeing here. Yeah, I guess even that was sufficient um, to not get mated, and then black's just up a piece with initiative. Oh, and the mate threat on g1. And white's king can't escape the mating net either. Uh, both players have a, a relatively solid pawn formation. Um, bishop pair has been exchanged. Uh, if the knight and bishop get exchanged, then we'll have another rook end game. And rook end games, while they're notorious for being drawn in slow chess, also in uh, bullet, they're notorious for a couple things. One, um, 
constructing a battery out of your two rooks on any rank on the board. And so Magnus prevents that possibility by uh, using his rook to cover this uh, rank here. Um, but two, uh, there's some king and rook versus king and rook positions where uh, online unpredictable results can happen very quickly. Where one player accidentally hangs the rook or mate. Uh, that pawn's not going anywhere. All right, yeah, get the rook behind the pawn. I guess, sure, that square works too. <laughs> okay, I did not expect that. Um, yeah. Now, sometimes players will move like king f5 and try to checkmate you um, with their advanced king, but Magnus isn't going to fall into mate in one. All right. So we have a King's Indian attack, um, except, um, well, I'm not an opening specialist either. So the, when things transpose from one thing to another, or when I fail to see that the pawns move to e5, um, I'm going to mislabel things. Okay, no, queen takes d3 doesn't work because a queen takes e8. Um, yep, yeah, gotta defend the knight and the e2 pawn, which is gonna come under attack, and white's just gonna castle, and, oh, that way? Really? Um, so, black's gonna activate all his pieces, and white's gonna hope that he can survive the attack. And black offers a queen trade? Did I just completely misestimate how powerful an attack on white's king on c1 could be? Maybe. Um, but yeah, now the queen side pawns just run up the board. Unless black starts moving his pawns. But pawns are slow. It is important to use all your pieces. Um... Yeah, so black's got h1 under control. Oh! White had intended to do knight c6 the whole time, but black preempted that with uh, bishop g2. So retreat the bishop. Oh, you can't push h2, so you use this pawn to support the h2 push. Pawns are slow. No, it takes like four moves for black to get h2 in. And he just needs just one more tempo to do it. There we go. You finally got the pawn up, and um, yeah, that's the game. Yes, indeed. <laughs> yep. And forgive me, I don't know how to pronounce that. I could say okay, ZH. I'm not sure. Um, we have a 2600 rated opponent here. Um, we're playing into it in exchange. Um, white's pawns are solid. Bl um, black's king side is a bit cramped, but otherwise solid. Yeah, we're going to liquidate there. Which undoubles the pawns, but also produces some air around the king. Uh, all white's pawns are on the dark squares, which really does not contribute to his attacking chances. So, it's funny, like, as uh, computer chess has evolved, like, some players would try these ideas against the computers, where you just produce this beautiful fortress. Uh, I think Hikaru's done this against some engines on chess.com. Um, and... Black seems to have done something similar, where she just built this uh, fortress around her king and is just waiting for Magnus to attack. Um, and I'm sure he'll eventually get around to it, but it seems like uh, materials even. Um, okay, and yeah, now the white 
queen side just completely run away with it. Uh... Yeah, Leela could be cool. Um, I do like how Leechus produced this bot API. So anybody could hook up their own engine to the site and play against uh, other engines. Um, there's a lot of manual work involved in challenging those opponents, and Leechus isn't really seeking to do anything quite like TCEC, where everybody would just submit engines to the site and the site would just run these tournaments. Uh, TCEC already exists. Uh, Leechus isn't really trying to replace that at all. But, um, yeah, it could be kind of cool to get Le uh, Leela Chess Zero on the site. Um, if for nothing else, um, it could be interesting to use it for analysis someday. And that's just a question of when does it become practical to do something like that. Maybe never, maybe soon, I don't really know. <laughs> it's funny, I've preempted the question, have I not? Uh, is it possible? Probably. Other sites have done something like that. Um, I was going to correct myself and say that one other site has done something like that, but I think it's more than one at this point. It's just, do you have enough resources to throw at it, and do you really think it's worth doing? Does Leela work well in a browser? Um, I'm looking for more information than that, I guess. Other than, well, I'm sorry, you're saying, yep, I preempted the question. All right, let's see we got a dissenter in the channel. That's exciting. Huh. So it looks like Magnus has got a tough position here. going to take him some time to defend this unless like everything just liquidates how did that happen and now yeah okay the draw is agreed Um, so yeah, I remember when uh, Leela Chess Zero was first deploying for playing against humans. They had a website you would go to, you'd submit your moves, and um, uh, the site would accept the moves and then relay them on some server to the engine, and the engine would come up with a response, and then you'd see it on the board on the website. Um, that was pretty exciting, uh, at least in the days where humans were able to defeat it. Um, but you're asking, I think, can you run uh, the Leela Chess Zero with all of its data and whatever super special libraries it takes to get that running? Does that all work inside a web browser? And my answer is uh, it's probably not possible to run Leela entirely in a web browser right now. Um, I'd be surprised if somebody already got that working. It's going to be some hobbyist who just takes all the source code and finds a way to do it and proves me wrong. They're, somebody's eventually going to do that, but I don't think it's been done yet, and I don't think it's possible yet. Got a new pairing here against another Grandmaster with a, another high rating. Um, okay, we got a Pierce. We got a Pierce with H3, my nemesis. Oh my goodness. Um, well, looks like White's played a solid opening and is moving quickly, making our world champion think. And the world champion, I don't know if he's got any special Pierce preparation or not, but um, 
I'm guessing if he does, he hasn't shown it here. So b5 drops. Um, we liquidate into an endgame immediately. White's queen at h6 is off sides unless white keeps the rooks on, which he doesn't. So now we're going to see the queen retreat. And white's going to try to hold this because um, he's got a space deficit. Um, black voluntarily trades queens into this endgame. Not sure why, other than maybe... Uh, I don't know. He is something of an endgame genius, but I don't know. Well, that'll do it. I guess with the queens on the board, there's a greater chance of a perpetual. Um, where the queen can just keep checking the king and there's no way for the king to safely escape the checks. Okay, I'm going to pretend I didn't see that opening thing there, because I thought I saw something that really couldn't have been there. Usually when white takes um, a d5 there, black does not immediately counter by taking on f4. I could be imagining something, but anyway, it looks like uh, white's got this beautiful space advantage. Um, White does have a weakness on c3. That said, the weakness is on c3, so good luck getting at it. Um, I'm sure uh, White could stir up some activity to keep Black thinking. Okay. I guess White considered something tactical that I didn't see. There's a fork, threatening mate. Black defends the mate. And so you remember I said the weakness was on c3. Black's knight on h5 is not going to hit that. <laughs> Alright, white defends and the c-pawn promotes. There we go. Oh, I guess the queen h3 check is probably what black missed. Because otherwise black gets it to promote as well, because uh, g4 was covered by the knight. So queen h3 was necessary to stop the promotion. That was tricky. Granted, even if black promoted, white had a time advantage and ways to attack the black king, so probably black would not have been able to salvage that on the clock. But it's nice to resolve things on the board, too. Uh, what's up with white's king side? It's good that he could trade queens, because, like, that made me nervous for a second. I wish I had my user style at the ready, the one that allows me to, like, put the screen into Zen mode. So I would see just, here's the board, here's the clocks. Um, I mean, I guess for doing this sort of broadcast, uh, it might be nice to see the player names and ratings too. Um, but uh, yeah, for broadcasts, it'd be nice to hide most of things like the upper menu, the left side. Um, I don't know. All right, players agree to a draw. And note that agreeing to a draw means you get to play your next game sooner. So they could have, like, shuffled this out for another minute or so and then reached a draw, but... Um, the one downside to agreeing to a draw, at least in terms of tournament scoring, is that um, it breaks your winning streak. Oh, boy. I would not want to be defending this on the white side. So white's not castling kingside, and white is castling queenside, but we'll see what good it does him. 
Um, I guess queen e3 must have not worked. Regardless, white's down a piece. White's still down a piece. All right, black uses all of his pieces. And takes the open file. And takes all of white's king side. And white tries to checkmate black's king in the middle of this pawn formation thing. And black has enough space. Yeah, there we go. Also, the rook drops. <laughs> oh yeah, you're right. That in terms of broadcasting the event, it'd be nice to have the standings in the left column. Um, I'd like to. I don't know if I could figure that out. Not sure if I could get both pages active at the same time. Let's see. Let me try. This is going to be tricky. Do I have another browser I could use? Just so I don't lose my mind trying to get this going? No? Okay. Uh, I guess we'll bring up another instance of the same browser. And hopefully that doesn't break anything. No, it looks okay so far. Um, so then we'll find our way over to the tournaments. Titled event. Um, huh. Now, the standings, that doesn't really fit in the left column. It's like half the size of the board. I could show, like, who's number one, number two, etc., but the full standings, especially the score, is not going to fit in the columns, so, like, what's the point? Um,. Oh, could I resize the additional window? There is a thought. Um, what happens if I do that? Okay, okay. So I make this additional browser as narrow as possible. Uh, it's still a work beyond what I'm able to achieve right now. Like, yeah, I have narrowed it but I don't have a way of collapsing all the scores in the center column. And I don't think I keep keep both windows as the active window at the same time, so I don't think they both refresh either. Um, I should work on getting a Python plugin for OBS to get that going. Yeah, it'd be very nice to have a plugin. You could just drop into OBS to just show the live tournament uh, standings and scores. Um, Black's King made an adventure pretty far up the board. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess the knight on f6 is defended by the g-pawn. So there is no opposite move there except if white wants to sack the knight. Wait. Why'd you take there first? Why not take the rook and then take on e4? That looked winning to me. So I guess black must think this is also winning. You might be right. He also, also, he might be mated. Um, F5. No F5. Did I just miss something? I guess what I missed is that... Okay, no Rook G4 either. I guess Rook G4 tactically didn't work. For a minute there, it looked like you could do Rook G4 and F5 to connect the Rooks. But then pawn takes forks the rooks and there's no check. Huh. Ok. 
can uh, dismiss my extra window. E4. There we go. Bishop F2. Or not. Um, I guess this is another way to play it. Black favors peace activity. Well, black can't take the d-pawn because uh, the bishop h7 would expose an attack from the queen on d1 to d5. Um, black continues to not capture on b2 because he doesn't need to and it wouldn't help. Um, he gets his queen trapped, um, which leads to the question, how many seconds is a queen worth? Because, like, by playing quickly, he did manage to keep up on the clock, but now he's fallen behind. So, um, I can't really be too critical because it's difficult to play accurate moves against such a strong opponent. But, um, there is a saying about just an ounce of caution is worth a pound of cure. Or prevention is worth a pound of cure. So, spending a couple seconds searching for tactics you'll probably end up losing the game on time in the end but um it's worth trying to find everything that's going on even in the chaos of a speed chess game all right materials level there's a hole on d4 and white's going to attempt to fill the hole there's also a hole on f3. And white is cramped and makes a bid for liberty and black's... Oh, not going to push past. There he goes. There's the push past. And yeah, white is hosed. Materials level, but good luck saving this one. Um... That's an interesting breakthrough. Yeah, rook f2 and rook f1 don't work right now. Um, white has too many pieces guarding the second rank. That deflects from the second rank. And we're going to go back to the second rank so we don't get mated. Except maybe we get mated on f1 instead. I'm not sure. All right, we're pinned down. We're stepping out of the pin. There we go. And I guess that's how you survive an attack from the world champion. Okay. We're going to be careful not to accidentally push the B-pawn too far, but we're forced to do it. So now opposition matters, and becomes a race, and... Uh, white survives the race, and we trade, and we, yeah, we're going to stalemate our somebody. All right, that was exciting. Oh, wow. All right, black seems um, has built this pawn formation that doesn't have any um, immediate weaknesses in it. Like h6, you could argue is a weakness, um, but it's really hard to exploit with the rook on h8. Um, on the other hand, having the rook on h8 means you can't really castle. Um, wow, tactics. Oh, I see. Because knight c3 was threatened and queen a2 was a follow-up, there was no way for white to capture on e4. White thought he had everything covered, resulting in the variation we just saw. Wow, that was sharp. Uh, 
Yeah, Penguin and Elyris are, um, well, the ratings don't lie. Um, everybody's performing well. And it is out, it is possible to outperform the champion. Okay, the bishop on e3 is trapped, so if black keeps, the way to black keeps the bishop pairs by retreating, and I expected like knight f5 and knight takes e3, instead we get this excitement. Um, so neither player has the bishop pair, black does have a bishop, most of black's pawns are in light squares, so they complement each other, and then black trades that off. So I guess he's traded his positional advantages for some initiative, but it didn't quite work. Uh, queen takes d4 is a threat preventing queen takes h3. All right, we got a race on our hands, and the pawn drops. Not sure I would have resigned there, but um, I guess that's why I'm not a grandmaster. <laughs> oh boy. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that looks like it came out as a link. The e pawn drops, but white doesn't take it. Instead, black takes the e pawn. Now white returns the favor, chooses to not play queen c7 because, like, probably there's a queen trap there eventually. Um, black has the bishop pair, white has the better middle. Uh, like, yes, white's pawns are on the same color as the bishop, but here. Once the bishop's outside the pawn chain, that doesn't matter so much. Okay, I don't know that black has time to be pushing pawns while, like, everything's weak. So, and often pushing them um, results in having to push them again. On the other hand, like, black just missed queen b1 check twice in a row. So either he missed it or like there was something really significant I didn't see because like that seemed to at least where white's queen was it looked like black was going to capture on b3 and get a uh, I don't know a passed pawn that would be impossible to stop bullet chess is hard all right there's a fork now we take the pawn Now we find some uh, shelter for the king. Uh, instead of queen e5, we play the queen there. We have this discovery and we're pushing the center instead. Uh, we find that we could stop the f pawn. That just is the simple way to go. Otterissa at 80, Penguin at 76, Magnus at 75 with an hour to go. Hmm. Not sure I understand what Knight C3 was about. Like, everything else here makes some sense to me, but... Um, I guess it was to preempt what Black's trying to do right now, but uh, I think Rook B8 and Black gets to do it anyway. Black's trying to play solidly and then realizes, oops, F8 is hanging. So, um, yeah, it looks like Black's attack is stalled. That's... That's a bit painful. 
All right, setting up a sacrifice, defending the A1 square. Black's knight on h5 is still out of the game. And we are not playing f6 because... why? There it is. Okay, I'm confused. Interesting. So we can undermine the position there and then break through the C-pawn. Wow. That was sharp. And there's a mate on G7 if black takes on C8 too many times. I'm curious, though. Bishop takes C8. What does white do? I guess we'll never know. At least I won't know. You probably know. Well, that's what I was saying. Like, bishop takes C8, um... And if white takes on c8, black can take, and that's check. I think both players hallucinated there. Or it was just a really clever bluff. Well, somebody's going to eventually put that... Like, after the event, I guess I'll take another look at it. Probably not on stream, because I won't be able to find the game in time, but... Bishop takes... Rook takes c8 isn't check. Black taking on c8 is check. And there's no mate on g7. So there's something I missed there. Might have been bishop takes c8, rook g7. I don't know. It was messy. Ah. All right. Interesting. We have a retreat. And white stays in the center. What the heck? And white is looking for peace activity. Um, I guess he's saying that king safety is just an illusion. We don't need to believe in anything about king safety. All right, so the bishop on f2 is defended by black's queen hiding on a7. Uh, so black wins a piece. And a fork, but no, we don't want the fork. We just want to trade? Okay. I guess that slows white's attack pretty severely. And the c2 rook is pinned and gone. go after the bishop which retreats and the a5 pawn drops and something happened there oh i guess the pawn didn't drop we just exchanged the a pawn for the f pawn um which in the middle game is exciting because black gets to attack because uh, white has no f pawn in the end game it means that this a pawn might become a monster um but um we'll see We'll see if we get an endgame today. We take... Okay, we don't take on h6. Now do we take... There we go. Only once it became the most important threat. And now we take the... Yeah. 
f6 is like super loose and both uh, neither rook can move to the sixth rank neither rook can safely move to the seventh rank um, but magnus doesn't want a rook he wants uh the rook and the mate so tough break Nahil Sarin. Or Nahal Sarin. Hmm. They're both very strong players, but uh, somebody's got to win. Alright, yep, this is thematic. You take the bishop pair in exchange. You have a slightly weakened king side and slight lag in development and space. And you try to remedy that, uh, which is going to require some tactics. And we castle out of it just in time. Uh, we do have to give back the bishop pair. And we're also losing the seventh rank. Um, and we're probably losing the D pawn. Um, okay, I guess um, white sacked in exchange to get this. Uh, rook h1. We don't see rook h1 today. All right. I guess rook h1, rook c8 um, wins the knight. So again, I'm not a master. I'm trying to commentate, but the master see things that I won't. And occasionally I might spot one thing they might miss. All right, trying to bust open the center. There it is. That's going to be fun. That's the move I would have played. Now, keep in mind, I play a lot of unsound moves, so my endorsement's not the greatest out there. But, but boy, is it fun to play moves like that on the internet. If you're playing a tournament game in real life, maybe think twice about playing moves like that, unless your goal is just to have fun. Do I think Leechess is a more advanced search feature for games? Like on chess base. Oh, yeah, so it's interesting. Leechess just deployed a feature to help with searching of studies, which I think is pretty valuable. Um, so if people were to tag a whole bunch of studies with English opening or Queen's Gambit or I don't know what what all the tags are, but um, that seems like a very useful system to be able to tag studies um, and search them by tags, provided that the tags are well curated. And if there happens to be a problem with tag curation and people creating like all kinds of tags that aren't useful. Oh, that hurts. Yeah, I didn't really feel like commenting, uh, commentating that game because it was self-evident what was going on. Um, so if m misuse of tags becomes kind of an issue, uh, one way to resolve that would be by groups of people coming up with their own sets of tags that they are in charge of naming. Um, so, like, by attaching people's names to tags, maybe it bears more credibility. Or by attaching a, uh, a name of a group to a tag, they can regulate the use of that tag. But I think in general people agree on what opening names are and such. Oh, it's already a mess. Okay. I, like I said, I didn't know. How did I get a Project Euler badge? Um by doing Project Euler, um, by solving something over a hundred of their uh, puzzles. Anybody can go to the site. Um, it's a good way to 
practice either uh, coding challenges or a fun way to learn a new programming language. Yep, there we go. White wins an exchange and the pawns break away and white develops the bishop. Yep, it's hard to calculate everything and not lose time. The whole point of Project Euler is that people who aren't educated enough in it um, can become educated. You don't have to go to a university to learn things. Oh, how is it embedded in my Lee Chess profile? Uh, it's an image. I think it's hosted. I forget where it's hosted. Maybe Imager? I don't recall. But you can embed images in your profile. All right. Uh, white develops the knight. Wait, was rook b1 not trapping the queen? No, because there's queen c2. I got excited there for no good reason, because usually white's queen's on d1 or d2, and usually rook b1 does constitute a queen trap. Um, but there, I got a bit too excited. All right, we're eventually going to take the bishop. It is a terrible bishop on f1, but in the end game, a bishop is a bishop. Oh, we don't need to take the bishop. Okay. So white's got a runaway queenside pawn, but um, white doesn't have a king. That's a bit of an issue. Rook f2 might have been worth a try, but I'm sure that's refuted by like knight e2 or something. Oh, um, I don't know. Like, do I not have this? I don't have this. Adcom Euler G Project Euler dot net. What's the link? There it is. Wow, I guess my bot's a bit slow on the uptake, or my bot might be down. But it's not, it, it was up earlier. Um, I seldom do competitive programming. Um, I have a job. So, like, that's all the competition I need. Um, I have recreationally done it. Uh, my ELO's not quite 2,000. It's pretty high up there, though, for an amateur. I think for, like, the last decade or so, I've uh, been at uh, 1970 in the U.S. system. Um, what aspect I partake in? So... That's interesting. So I help develop, uh, or I'm one of the two maintainers of the multivariant Stockfish engine. Um, so I took Stockfish and gave it rules for variants, uh, along with other collaborators like Fabian Victor. Um, Um, and he maintains the site that does all the testing for the engine. So I can know um, when my changes are about to break something and so I don't release them. Uh, so but you're asking what contributions I've made to Leech Us. I've contributed to variant code to help like with the draw detection uh, rules as well as for standard chess. Um, all right, black force is a queen trade. Um, even though maybe he could have won in the middle game, I guess he's going for an end game. 
he does enjoy his end games. Um, but losing the A pawns gotta hurt a bit. Okay. So as soon as uh, Black gets a tempo to march that pawn down. Uh, are we not seeing a7 here? Just, I guess we're going to spend this tempo first. But a7's on the docket. It's eventually going to land. Oh, I missed that. That hurts. <laughs> um, I have contributed uh, to the draw detection in Scala, as well as um, helped with draw detection for variants in Scala. Um, you could actually search in GitHub under the codebase LILA uh, Leela, and you can just look at the history and see what I've contributed. It's compared to what other developers on the site do, it's pretty minimal. Um, but also, when I make changes, they tend to be controversial. So that's kind of exciting. <laughs> I'm like, hey, this would be great for chess players. And, I have strong opinions about what I think would help players. Um, some things I didn't develop that I do think are useful, um, or I do think are uh, novel to Lee Chess as well as useful. Uh, one is the insights feature. Um, so I know the developer who produced that was really excited about the feature when they did it, and um, some other developers are pretty excited about it. I still think it's useful. It, I think it's great that you could search through um, standard chess as well as variants and ask questions like, um, what's, I don't know, on average, how much am I blundering? And does luck play a factor in my games? And uh, when I play certain openings, uh, how do I try uh, tend to do? Um, and it takes the engine data and tries to produce uh, meaningful conclusions from it. That said, there's no substitute for a real coach. And yeah, coaches, uh, the whole coaching service thing, I think is one of Lee Chess better features as well. I've never participated in it from either a player or a coach perspective, or I guess a student or coach, but um, uh, I think it's fantastic that people around the world get a chance to communicate with each other and identify um, their favorite coaches. Um, and then I have opinions about like being able to learn from your mistakes. I think that's one of the best features of the site, and I don't use it very often because I've used engines like I'm almost at 2,000. Um, if I were to make 2,200 in my uh, nation's rating system, I'd be called a master in that system. So I'm not at that level of strength, but uh, I've been um, using engines forever, and I know how to meaningfully read the numbers and deduce, like, oh, that was a mistake, or that was inaccurate, and I know how to focus on which parts of the game um, uh, were trending points, like either because I missed something or because I thought I was better, or because I thought I'd misevaluated and I strongly disagreed with the engine in various positions. Um, I was able to identify which parts of the game do I most disagree with the engine in. Um, a lot of players haven't spent thousands of hours with engines. And so uh, having this feature, learn from your mistakes, which pinpoints here, this is where the engine disagrees with you. You and the engine go into a room and figure out um, whether or not you can come to an agreement. Um, that sort of thing, I think that's useful. So like after you've run an analysis on your game, there's a button that says learn from your mistakes. Um, and I think that's something we could all stand to learn a lot from. Um, All right, here we go. We got Andrew Tang and Magnus Carlson.
Um, so yeah, your question was, what have I contributed to? And my answer was that uh, in terms of code and Lee Chess, uh, stuff I've touched has mostly been the controversial stuff. Um, and I've avoided moderation related code with a 10 foot pole. I really don't want to have to discuss the fire and nuances of what, um, I don't know. Like if I could see something in the code, some potential to make something just objectively better with the moderation code, fine, I'll suggest it. Um, but I'll leave it to our human experts to figure out like what pieces of the moderation code work well for them. Um, and if they happen to mention that here's something we like help with, I could offer ideas, but I don't touch that code. Um, likewise, I don't really know a lot with UI stuff. I could suggest ideas, I could code review, I could say like, hey, this piece of code is broken and I think I figured out why. Um, but I usually don't touch the UI code very much either. I'm also not an expert at Scala. So when there's really challenging things in Scala, uh, and Lee Chess has its own like dialect of how to write Scala code, I don't touch that very much either. All right, we got an exciting endgame imbalance. It's just pity that we don't have more time on the clock to settle it. All right, fortress achieved. There's the fortress. And, uh, <laughs> okay well that's one way it could end um i guess both players were amicable with that result magnus because uh even though uh he's in the tournament lead position well i guess that's the reason is because he's leading the tournament he doesn't need more than a draw there even though he had a queen There is some code relating to move compression where I thought, hey, this would be an opportunity both for me to learn Scala and learn the Lee Chess dialect of Scala and learn some testing framework stuff. And so I did have a hand in that, found a couple ways to optimize the Java code for move compression, um, which I think is tested with the Scala harness or maybe there was some mix of Java and Scala code, and I found a way... Oh, I, I was asked to code review it, and I found by reordering some of the Java code, uh, there was a measurable, albeit really small, savings that could be achieved. Um, okay. I guess Magnus doesn't want to draw against this guy. <laughs> Even though, really, it would help him get more... Like, he just drew the last game. If he drew this game, too, like, that wouldn't hurt his chances any and would allow him to go on to the next game immediately and rack up some more points. So, I guess he really doesn't want to draw this guy. Um, granted, Magnus is really great at endgames, so if he wants to play on, uh, he'll probably find a way to win it. Oh, the tricky A7 there. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Maybe he just didn't want two draws in a row. Although, when I play in one of these tournaments, if I draw a game, I'm more inclined to just either win or quickly draw the second game. Here we go. Magnus and Ali Reza. Again, um, so yeah, in terms of code I've contributed, I haven't really contributed that much code. Um, in terms of uh, ideas, I regularly offer them to the Lee Chess team. And they'll pick some of my better ideas and run with them. And I do try to filter my own input because, like, um, 
if they take one of my ideas and run with it and okay that's not a fork but oh that's just mating that's pretty cool well um but yeah i try to filter my own input i give to the team because like if they commit to something that i suggested and it doesn't work out uh, who wouldn't feel guilty about something like that um Some could argue that, like, maybe some ideas weren't that great. But... Okay, we liquidate everything and then try to win an endgame. 95 is kind of fun. Alright, so Black's now tied down. I'm not sure if Knight F6 helped. Like, the further back the knight is, the less of a threat it poses to white. E3 is the only weakness here, and it's defended. Alright, and white's preparing g4, and black denies it. Um... I'm not sure I would have played rook c2. Uh, thankfully, we did find this fork that took the d-pawn. Without that, I'm not sure how this would have played out. Probably uh, Magnus would have just won on time. Uh, but now he can win on the position too. Okay, here's the matchup. This time with Ali Reza in second place in the tournament. Gotta trade that light squared bishop and um, see whether or not our defense is gonna hold. Oh, looks like we get a queen trade, but we choose not to take it. Queen trade's still on the table. Both players offering it. Neither one taking it because it gives up a tempo. And the tempo does mean a lot here. Alright. Um, White finally decides that he's going to give Black the Knight to g6 with tempo. Um, that, like, saving his king happens to be worth giving away the tempo. Alright, we're preparing to run the king. Uh, yeah, I think Black just missed something there. He is on time pressure. And there we go. Rather than flag, um, our champion concedes the game. And with it, uh, now Magnus is in second. Being at the top ain't easy. Okay. I guess, yeah, bishop c4 prevents castling. Yeah, it looks like black is toast. Um... I 
guess this wasn't so easy as I had imagined, but Black's still in pressure. Uh, he seems to have escaped whatever opening fate was awaiting him. And now he's going to start developing. Uh, white tries to break open the center. And we skewer. And we take the exchange. And we try to not get mated. There we go. There's our fortress. And maybe we can find some way into White's King's position? I'm not sure. Huh. We had a chance to play Queen e4. Okay, well, yeah, we take the open file. White keeps making pseudo threats and real threats, and oh, there's the threat. And White's up a rook. Speed chess is difficult. And okay, so white did find a way to take the pawn. It wasn't what I anticipated, but it works. It's a lot easier to predict how a rook moves than how a bishop moves. Um, in terms of like the rook to b3 and then rook takes b7, you could take, even if white had played uh, b8, you just move the rook one more square to take the promoted pawn. Oh boy. So I've been playing this kind of formation over the board recently, um, and just completely forgetting to advance on the queen side. Okay, we sack an exchange. Our exchange uh, sack might give us the vital tempo we need later. B6. B6 is the move. I guess this fork might be okay, but... Um, yeah, because this is what happens without B6. Now we take the bishop. Oh, but no, there's mate on C2. Uh, but taking an h6 was check. As soon as, soon as black gets a tempo, he's going to try to mate on c2. There we go. And he's going to play queen b3 or something. Oh, that's clever. Lure the king out to g4. Then take, or play queen b4 check and exchange the queens off so there's no mate. That's a hard one to find. That's like a Lee chess puzzle. <laughs> All right, we trade some pawns off. Trap the Black King. Try not to lose. Yep. Well, we got some tough competition today. Twenty-seven minutes left. Who's the next pairing going to be? Another three thousand. Right, so that forces an exchange, bishop for knight. So black no longer has the bishop pair. Uh, h5 is currently under white's control, but probably not for long. OK, 
Okay, white keeps building up for an f5 push, which apparently isn't viable. So white's going to try to break on the h-file instead. And then c5 gets thrown in and complicates everything. So does black take on g4? He does, but that only begins the series of questions here. Okay, so we sack, and then we play like rook f3? Yeah. And white's king escapes. Just barely, but that's all you need. Wait. Okay. I guess it's more complicated than I thought. And we take e7. And... Yep, white finally takes on g5. And black loses on time. Oh, just kidding. Black gets checkmated. That was exciting. That was a close game. Okay, we got ourselves a Berlin defense. Yeah, yeah, Magnus is not having his best performance at the moment. Uh, we can see Ali Reza's rating has spiked to 31.27, so he's having a pretty good event, in addition to being in first. Alright, um, White's queenside pawns uh, do limit the scope of his bishop. So, white's going to hope that he's going to get a sack later that somehow he can promote on the king's side. Or he trades the bishops. And black obliges. And now we have an interesting endgame. This one's not necessarily drawn. That other one looked pretty drawish, but... Now the knight on f8 can't move until black covers the e7 square and black gets zigzagged. Um, that hurts. Know your endgames, folks. <laughs> Even in bullet chess, they matter. Yeah, I think once the bishops got exchanged, that was um, very difficult to defend. There might have been a defense, but... Well, um, got a Botez Gambit. All right, that's over and done with. So yeah, to win these events, you have to have a consistent performance as well as a good one. Um, and for the first half of the event, uh, his performance was amazing and consistent, um, as it usually is. Uh, this second half, he really needs to build up a winning streak. He's got 22 minutes left to do it. Alright, he's trading into a winning endgame. He's going to win the end game because he's Magnus. That's just how it goes. Huh. I would have expected rookie too. I guess he's. Yeah, I guess this is just much more convincing. And White would rather not play it out. I guess at that end position, white's forced to exchange bishops. 
uh, or lose material. So it just wasn't worth con uh, continuing. Black exchanges on the A file. What the heck? Um, <laughs> so... I I don't know what's going on. Like at that pawn in h6, I think the uh, yes, there's a weakness on f6, but I think black can deal with the weakness without losing too much time. Yeah, I I was fully of the opinion that black could hold this, um, and that opening the a file only favors black. That's pretty nuts, um, but, you know, you get some exciting positions when you have open lines, so I guess what we're looking for is an exciting position. We do need some wins, um, or rather, white needs a win. I'm not sure. Um, I think black could have been content with a draw. Oh, there's a mate threat on the back rank. Um, that's sharp. There's still a mate threat, but um, that might be it. Uh, Black's king is trapped. Oh no. Oh wow. <laughs> and games are hard. Um, usually exchanging queens in that end game would have given you a decent position. But if your king is completely trapped and therefore your rook is stuck on the back rank, um, that's going to be pretty hard. Jeez, I feel bad for his opponent. That was a really close game. And the clock always plays a factor, so... Yeah, time management is important, too. It is fun to imagine in some other universe how things might have gone. All right, Magnus grabs the pawn and gives it back. Um, although he's defending e6, um, I guess he's got some initiative. He's taken the open file. Uh oh. All right, g6 is loose. Yep, we're going to hit the pawn anyway. All right, now get the king's side rolling and hope that it's fast enough. Pawns are slow. Uh, white needs to come up with a way to stop the black's runaway king side. All right, that'll do. White has consolidated, um, but is mated. One inaccurate move, rook a5. Wow, that's harsh. You gotta know your end games. It's not enough to think you know them. It's not enough to say, hey, I had this tournament game, and oh, if I had just seen the one move, and I knew about this move. No. You need to actually be in a position to play accurate moves in endgames. That's what knowing it means, is you can actually demonstrate it. Um, if you can't demonstrate it, do you really know it? Uh, that's I don't mean to be too critical, like in bullet chess anything can happen. But um, many half points and full points are decided in the endgame even at this level so yeah if the grandmaster can give away half a point um maybe you want to take it All right, um, yep, yeah, he's going after the c2 pawn, and his own center comes under fire. The knight's pinned, but uh, black liquidates. Mm. 
you know, we block out, we reduce the scope of the bishop. It's now biting on granite and whatever. So white sacks the bishop. Um, and black says no perpetual check for you. Wow, that was exciting. Um, we've trapped the rook. We take the rook, we take the pawn. And there's the mate. And with that, I don't think wizard is going to win the event. Um, and yeah, so Magnus has got some wins in a row. And we see he's gotten his first place ranking back. Um, not sure what happened with the other contenders. But, um, yeah, Magnus is in the lead. And being on a winning streak and in the lead is pretty good. Um, it might help that <laughs> having lost a few games, uh, his pairings are a bit different than they were some moments ago. That might help a bit. All right, Black Castle's, um, I guess, out of it. I was going to make a joke about castling right into the middle of an attack, but this seems mostly safe for his king. Um, I guess there was never a knight takes f7 trick, so yeah, we take that for sure. And the reason we take that is because the bishop's going to dominate a knight. It might be difficult, but if you're going to prove a win, um, you'd prefer to have this bishop on an open board against a knight. Uh, black needs to take the f-pawn immediately. Yep, black needs to take the f-pawn. There we go, we're going after the f-pawn. And it's too late. Alright. That wasn't easy to hold, but knowing your end games does help. Now, I guess you could say in his defense that, like, what is he supposed to do? Um, he played the best he could in the position. There maybe wasn't a way to salvage that endgame anyway, so... I'm just pointing out that, like, uh, as spectators, if we can evaluate um, whether uh, an endgame is won, lost, or drawn, uh, then when it crops up in our own games, we'll know... And if those games aren't a bullet game, we'll have time to figure out, is this the end game I want to go into or not? Uh, from both sides of that position. Like, if you see, ooh, I could have this bishop against a knight, and it's not a forced win, but I have really good potential to win this. Um, maybe you liquidate into it, or search it a bit deeper and see if that's what you really want to do. Um... If you're on the defensive side and you see, hey, I could get into this end game or I could play some unclear move. Ooh, the hammer. Oh, the hammer drops. That hurts. Uh, meanwhile, I'm talking about end games, and yeah, our our world champion is both fast and accurate. The knight can't move because queen takes g7, and if something else takes on d7, um, the knight on f6 drops. All right, we got Sergey. Sergey. Um, I'm not saying that right. Anyway, you can see his name. Um, all right, we've sacked a bishop on b7. Mind if we're a good player and we lose a piece, we call it a sacrifice. Um, it sounds more dramatic that way. Is this unclear? Okay. I'm not sure. Alright, so it looks like white's going to promote on the a8 square. 
Meanwhile, black is trying to checkmate white. It's kind of bold. If we take on g3, black um, has a discovered check. So white sacks the queen. He might, yeah, there is the promotion. Um, and black had the option of bishop takes h2, but then king g2 is a fork. Instead, we get this rook end game. Um, and black wins on time. Oh, yep, there's the black time win. Yep, that's how it goes. That hurts. Under U.S. rules, there'd be all sorts of fun rules about should that be considered a win or not. And that and, like, the 50 positions before it. And so you could get into this endless series of debates about what constitutes a fair win. Um... The FIDE rules are a bit clearer. They're like, um, yeah, if you can checkmate, uh, then, you know, that's a win. Okay, but E takes? What's going on here? Oh, we castle to get out of threats, we take the exchange back, and we've got this interesting queenside advance going on. Black was able to defend the C-pawn. Um, and it's not looking good for white. Uh, that said, the A-pawn is about to race if we do something too aggressive. Yep, white does the only thing he can do. Black takes the free pawn. Well, okay, so the rooks are disconnected. Okay, now you can take on c4. Uh, right, so d5 drops, and we have a fortress. And when you're playing against the world champion, it doesn't matter that you have a fortress. He'll find a way to break through. That's just how you do. Um, note, white should never take on g5. Um, all right, white's king is forced out of the box. And, yeah, the f-pawn drops. Uh, wait, I had that backwards. That was the world champion defending the fortress. Um, and he just, unfortunately, his king got ousted. Um, I had that perspective backwards, but still. We have many of the world's top players playing on the site. So, yeah, you wouldn't want to defend that against anyone, honestly. All right, e4 is loose. Not very loose, but like that's going to be the next target. Um, all right, f5 is eventually... Oh. Okay, tactics. Tactics, tactics everywhere. So the a file gets open, the e4 square is still loose. It's just kind of a running gag here. Um, okay, we develop the knight to the center because it makes a threat with tempo. Um, the bishops are opposed, so like it's not advantageous or disadvantageous to either player. Uh, white's banking on the center not opening. Black opens the center. And c3 is going to be a threat. White steps out of uh, that ugly, um, somewhat trapped position, somewhat cramped. Uh, Black successfully trades some rooks and builds up a huge initiative. And needs to stop d6 before it goes anywhere, but is d6 still going to happen? Oh dear. Well, that was exciting. Wow. All right. Uh, we got six minutes left.
Got six minutes left to catch up. And we go berserk. Uh, got our trusty King's Indian attack going. And we sack a pawn. King barely survives and rook g8. Oh, that was brutal. Like, I think rook e8 might have decided it. This is pro uh, still very scary, but not as clear. Okay, we are out. We're down a night. Oh, we're not out. Never mind. <laughs> right, we go berserk again. We sacrifice a knight. We sacrifice an exchange. And some pawns. Okay, black starts to develop. All right, here we go, another rematch. No going berserk this time. There's no time for it. So if we win this and the games after it, we might have a chance. If we can break our opponent's winning streak and ourselves build up a really nice winning streak in the next few minutes, we might have something. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be rough. Then, of course, Ali Reza is going to um, like put up a fight in all the other games, too. So we need a win. Looks like we followed the wrong person. Oh, come on. How fun would it be if you knew, like, who was going to win the event before it started? All right, we've got to go win this somehow. we got three minutes left. So we need to win, like, four games in two minutes. And we also need to win this one. It could happen. We just have to have faith. Yeah, we can win the... Oh, never mind. Oh, nice. Alright, we're still competing for second. So, as soon as we get a pairing, any day now, assuming we're in the pairing pool, um, yeah, that was rough. Like, what happened this game? Magnus paused. All right, let's go back and view the tournament. I uh, guess we're going to look at Ali Reza's game. He didn't quit. He paused. Quitting would mean you don't get the prizes. I don't know if we have that option. <laughs> rage paused. Yes, I will ragefully pause. Yes, brilliant. Truly unique move. Alright, looks like Ali Reyes has got this one, too. Rage, collect money. Yeah. That's why, like, when you're playing in tournaments, they got prizes for everyone. Um, 
they want everybody to obey the rules and so like their prizes eh, people will obey the rules they'll abide by them made on g7 oh oh and then there's gonna be this fork on e2 oh that stings because otherwise queen g7 would be made but here it's just not legal all right i don't think there's gonna be a time for another pairing there um so uh that sums it up wow okay yeah magnus comfortably took second uh penguins paused uh yep so again grandmaster 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 etc what a strong showing man th this tournament has come a long way all right let's refresh this da, 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 da. okay not sure why you didn't get sound effects but it'll do so congrats out here is a like yeah 78 percent win rate that's pretty awesome um Magnus did try going berserk a few games in the end. Didn't quite work the way he hoped. Um, got uh, Penguin GM. Uh, yeah, Andrew Tang scored really high up there. Uh, it is worth noting, yeah, the player with the best tournament performance did win. This is not some fluke of the pairing system. They did actually show a numeric performance that was very good. So, yeah, what an event.